Welcome to the Wall Street Lab podcast, where we interview top financial professionals and deconstruct their practices to give you an insider look into the world of finance. Here are your hosts, Lucas Musialski and Leo Severino. Hello and welcome to the 10th episode of the Wall Street Lab podcast. Yes, it's already been 10 episodes. We're really happy to have reached this milestone, especially that, Leo, we recently read an article that most podcasts don't make it beyond the seventh episode. So reaching this threshold really means something to us. And today we're actually going to bring you something a bit different, something that a lot of the people have been asking for. So what we're going to do today, we're going to talk more about how to get into investment banking. And we've been receiving a lot of questions regarding the career steps that you should take and uh, developments, different exams that you could take, as well as how to perform in interviews and similar conversations. So we have taken your advice to heart and Leo is going to tell you more what we have prepared for you today. Just from my part, I want to thank you guys for being in this ride with us. We receive emails from you guys every once in a while and it's always a pleasure for us to see that we are able to reach some people and be able to help you guys in any way possible. So that's what keeps us going and that's what makes us try to get the best guests possible. And today it's no different. We had the pleasure of talking to Ian Morgan. Ian Morgan is today an interview coach, but the most interesting thing about Ian is that he used to be in the investment banking industry actually for 20 years before he decided to start his own company. In his last position, he was a managing director at uh, Societe Generale. So he's been through the path that a lot of you want to go through. So the interview was was very unique and he, he gave some really good insights about how to prepare for an interview, how to prepare your, your CV and your cover letter. Also, once you get to that interview, how should you behave and what are the things that you should talk about? And also after you get hired, how do you make sure that you prepare yourself to perform at your highest potential once you're hired? So this is a very nice interview, very uh, broad ranging, and I learned a lot from it. So I hope that you guys learn as much as, as I did. And also I wanted to make sure that you have some of your follow-up questions answered. We used a Reddit post to, to ask you some questions that we might ask Ian, and we made sure to use some of them during the interview. But I know that some of those questions that you had probably didn't get answered during an interview, so we thought we would allow you to send us emails. You can send an email to contact at thewallstreetlab.com and send any follow-up questions that you have for Ian, and we'll make sure that we'll pick the, the best ones and send it his way. We didn't talk to Ian about this, so Ian, I hope that you're okay with that. Yeah, also, if you would like to reach out to us, if you have any propositions as who you would like to have interviewed, also, we're really happy to receive messages from you, and please feel free to make suggestions, and we'll definitely respond to you. Okay, well, I think you're probably tired of listening to the two of us talk. So without further ado, please enjoy our interview with Ian Morgan. Well, a small further ado will be <laughs> if you enjoy the show, please leave us a glowing review on iTunes and it really helps us grow the show. And without any further ado, please enjoy our interview with Ian Morgan. Hello, Ian. Thank you very much for agreeing to be part of the Wall Street Lab podcast. I have to say that I'm really excited about this interview because this is my way of getting a free consultation from you, but also <laughs> because a lot of our audience have questions about how to get into investment banking and how to, how to make sure that they improve their chances of getting an interview and once they get the interview, how do they increase their chances of getting hired? And even though this is a, an episode that's different from the other ones, I think a lot of people are going to have a lot to take from this. So thank you again for, for being part of it. Leo, no problem at all. Uh, you know, thanks for having me on. You know, I love the idea of a, a podcast, you know, 21st century way of sharing uh, what we're all doing. 
And, uh, yeah, it's an honour to come on and share with you some of my thoughts about uh, what I'm up to these days. And if I can, uh, you know, add some value to your audience, then, you know, it'll be a great podcast. Okay, definitely. So let's start off by just telling us what you do, how you got to where you are today. Okay, um, I'll try and compress uh, what has been probably a 25-year career into a, into a few a few minutes. Um, so uh, right now I'm managing my own business. I'm an executive coach and qualified as an executive coach, taking a diploma in that and really building a business around essentially helping professionals achieve higher levels of performance. I guess that's that's how you'd say it. It sounds a bit cliched, but I think essentially coaching is all about you know, working with people to help them you know, attain more success or achieve more, uh, you know, hit some goals that they, they really want to hit in their lives. So, so I'm coaching individuals and essentially working with people in, um, uh, in finance or people who want to uh, move into finance. And then alongside that, I'm also developing a second strand of my, my business, which is um, actually working with small companies more as a consultant, where I'm helping them learn how to grow their business, how to, how to build better client relationships, how to effectively manage their own enterprise um, more efficiently. So, you know, a couple of different strands, but all of which are um, keeping me very interested at the moment and busy. Okay, yeah, I, I can imagine that. Now, you are a managing director at a large international investment bank. I'm curious to know right. what, what made you go from a position that so many people aspire to be to running your own business? Yeah, it's a great question and you know, one that uh, has been asked of me quite a lot and you know, something that I thought about a lot um, as, as I made the transition, of course. And you know, you're absolutely right. Being an MD was a was a fabulous time in my career. It was you know awesome to to get that promotion and to make it, if you like, into that club, which I think um, a lot of people in certainly in finance and investment banking uh, they see you know a position as an MD as a real target in a career. But at the same time, you know, I, I kind of had a burning desire to explore being an entrepreneur. You know, I kind of had a sense that there's this enormous um, explosion in, in digital business, in, in you know, social media marketing, in, in online effort, if you like. And um, I kind of fell in, the, in love with the idea of building a business around my expertise and my skills and building perhaps, you know, eventually some digital products around that and exploring that opportunity. You know, and I'll be honest, I was working in, in an organization of 150,000 people, my last bank, and even in the investment bank, there was about 13,000 people. So, you know, I, I was in a large organization where I think I was probably sensing that my contribution and my ability to change the machine and move the organization you know, it's tough, uh, and I really wanted to give myself a shot at um, really um, being my own boss and, and seeing what I could create, or, yeah, almost from scratch, you know, and uh, and I, I guess at my age, I'm 47 now, I, I was, you know, feeling a need for a fresh challenge in my life as well, so lo lots of reasons, but all came together and really kind of encouraged me in to, to take make this move and, you know, throw myself at it. I'm really curious to know what the day that you went to, I don't know if you had a boss because you're already an MD, mm. but what was mm. that day like for you? And the follow-up question to this is, what was the very first day in your new role as your own boss? What, what were those days like? Mm. Okay. Well, I was, to be honest, I was lucky to have a great boss. And we had a brilliant relationship. We'd worked together for all of my career at uh, SOCGEN, so that was 10 years. Um, we'd always worked alongside each other, or I'd reported to him. And it was actually an easy conversation. You know, he had a sense that, you know, just from knowing me well, that I was looking for something more professionally, something different. And, uh, you know, he, he as, a, as a good boss should be, he was tuned in to that and he wasn't desperately surprised either. So it was actually a great conversation. And, and I think he was professional enough and mature enough to just wish me all the best really so it, it couldn't have gone easier so that was that day and then um my first day in as the start of my new career was i just felt you know unbridled energy and enthusiasm and joy to be frank leo you know i'd i kind of been plotting this move for many months and figuring out what i wanted to do and 
you know, I, 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 honestly, the next day I just I just got cracking at my new business. You know, I, I had some material. I was working on a website. I, I just wanted to throw myself into it straight away because I had the energy and the you know and the kind of desire to to get cracking straight away and not lose a moment. So it was a brilliant transition, to be honest. Okay, I think I could talk to you about this for hours, but I think we we should probably start to focus on the real topic of this conversation, which is uh, how to get into and how to become successful in, in in the investment banking industry. So I thought before we we started, I thought that we would break this interview down into three parts. The first one would be before going to an interview and how you increase your chances of actually getting that phone call to, to and be invited for an interview. The second part would be the interview itself. So how do you improve your chances of, of making a good first impression and actually being hired? And the third part would be you're already hired at a company. How do you make sure that you become the best version of yourself within that role and you climb the corporate ladder as you did in your previous career? We received some questions from listeners, and I would, I would start with a question from John from Toronto, and he asked, What do successful candidates do that unsuccessful candidates generally do not? Okay, that's a great opener. Very good question. I think the first thing is to build anticipation for the interview. And what I mean by that is I loved finding a CV on my desk where I read it and I thought, wow, this guy or lady sounds fantastic. You know, and I wanted to get revved up to, to go and meet them because I'd get excited about making a great hire. So for me, the lesson is always you can stand out easily on your CV by just really paying attention to structuring it in a way that excites a reader. And, you know, frankly, the, the, the threshold to impress is very low because most CVs are you know, not poor but just bland or unexciting or unimaginative. And they're not, they're not unusual enough to get me excited. And whenever I'm working with a client, I talk about, literally planting CV traps. So what I mean by that is put something on your CV that is unusual, you know, a, a very special achievement or something relating to a, a story from your past which which explains why you're so passionate to get this role or you know, something that's authentic and relatively unique, something that really encourages the interviewer to, you know, want to talk about that in the interview. So I'd say, first of all, your CV, you should think about priming that to really spark interesting conversation. That's the first point. I think the second point is just in terms of the structure of the CV, always, always have an executive summary at the top, which is highlighting your greatest achievements. Because essentially when people are looking to hire candidates, you, you want to hire people who are doers, people who go somewhere and make a difference. You know, they've got achievements to their name. And too many CVs just omit this, this basic thing and, and explain what roles they've been in, but people need to explain what they've achieved and put concrete numbers wherever you can. You know, if you've moved the budget by improve, improve numbers by 30%, put that down. You know, anything that you can actually put down in numbers to highlight an achievement is, is really good stuff on a CV. So that's the CV. I think in terms of all showing up, um, you know, in, interviewing is, is, is like jumping through hoops. You've, You've got to have a CV that gets past um, an automatic tracking system, uh, essentially the, the AI that will check that your skills match all the keywords. You need to get past HR, and you need it to get in front of the hiring manager. So it's, it's a, often a challenging enough process, even if you think you've got all the right skills. To be creative, develop your network, find out some people in your target organization who you know work in an area where you'd like to work, And, you know, see if you can get in front of a hiring manager. See if you can make direct contact. And then if someone sees that you're a, a, an excellent candidate, they will then tell HR, I'm going to interview this person. I want to interview this person. And then you take out that kind of that lottery or that roulette that HR might just, you know, glance past your CV and miss out on a great candidate. So you, you could take these things into your own hands for sure. What about a cover letter? I've, I've struggled with this in the past, too, and it, I always had to ask myself, 
do I write a cover letter that looks just like everyone else's? You know, you have that structure that you can, you know, Google it and you find thousands of articles of, about it. Or do I write something that is so different and sometimes, you know, it can sound maybe aggressive to some hiring managers? Mm. Would you recommend people to sort of go with with a crowd or should should they try to write something creative and maybe funny or maybe aggressive even uh, to increase yeah. their chances? Okay, well, first of all, let me grab your phrase there, go with the crowd. Never go with the crowd because there are too many pick candidates who all have the same skills, who don't stand out, and they're all fine, but they just get lost in the crowd. So... Be somehow try and be original, you know, in a professional way. I mean, you know, try and be funny. I'm I'm not so sure because you've got to then be able to judge the the humour of the uh, the hiring manager, but or, or or the HR manager. But certainly make make passion really leap out of the page. Okay, make make it a million percent clear why you're the person to fit this role. And and I think it's that. I always come back to this word authentic. I mean, anyone can want a job, but you know, you've got to persuade someone that this job is kind of tailor-made for you, and you're the greatest candidate for the job. And you can do that if you if you work hard on your on the, the words you use, avoid cliches, just you know, almost make it come as as though it's you know from the heart rather than from the, the mind. So it's so it's really genuine. And and I would use that yeah you, know, you use that word be aggressive yeah I think I like pushy candidates I like people who have got something to prove and you know prepared to put their head above the parapet as we'd say and and get shot at but take take a bit of a risk why not you know what have you got to lose uh, you touched on on trying to meet the people within the organization you want to work for and there's mm. a question from from Jacob from Miami and he asked. Uh, can you talk about networking best practices? I'm having trouble getting responses to my cold emails. <laughs> I can understand why cold emails don't get answered. But look, I think we've all, the key thing is to be resourceful. And it, what that means is look at your existing network and just map out who you know who could be a useful person to introduce you to someone else. And, you know, getting a job is a job, as you know. So you've got to be persistent. You've got to be diligent. You've got to think it through. Have a game plan. You know, m most people, and me included, probably have always been a little bit um, skeptical of the value of a network or networking events are a bit cliched. But um, you have to network with a purpose. What value can I get from my network? And then once you ask that question, you'll start to get a sense of who the go-to people are. And the other thing is, with the network, try and avoid them all being the same people. You know, try and mix it up a bit. Try and be creative about the people you know, because you never know. You know, if, if you've got a more, more broadly dispersed network, then I think by definition you're going to have more chance of getting in front of more different interesting people in a way. So I would say you've got to be purposeful about networking. Don't send emails. Call people. You know, just be persistent. Try, yeah, you know, work your way up. If you, if you think a director is a guy who's doing the hiring, you know, find an analyst or an associate who works in the team, build a relationship, build some rapport, and then ask for a favour. You know, you've got to put yourself out there and go hunting. That's essentially what you've got to do. I have another question from Eric, and he he's asking, what are some of the practical skills? to learn if a candidate did not major in business and finance and wants to uh, transition into the finance industry? Okay, if you didn't major in business and finance, practical skills. I think I'll come back to a word I just used, which was uh, resourcefulness. So show that you can um, pull some value together. Look at, look at what the job requires in terms of the deliverables. See if you can go out there and solve the, the hiring manager's problem. Think about... What, you know, if you can look at the job spec through the hiring manager's eyes, you get a sense of what their day-to-day -day issues are. Why are they hiring that person? What do they need that's missing in their setup today? And then think about how you could put that, put that possible answer together. So, you know, to, to make that more concrete, I was working with a client recently who, uh, he's out of work and he's, he wants to be an equities analyst and he's got some, you know, some experience in that, in that area, but he's not, 
been an equities analyst, but that's his passion. So he's actually been working on his own spreadsheets for company valuations. He's, you know, he's done some real life studies, if you like, that he sent off to a friend of his who's an asset manager for feedback. And then he's got, and what he's done is taken that work and put it into a pack with some highlights to then send off to put in front of people who are trying to hire equities analysts. You know, and so, so he's giving any hiring manager a sense of he could land in that job and do that job, even if he's not got necessarily on paper the right credentials. That's the first answer. I think actually, Leo, what I would also say is incredibly important is we have to bear in mind that skills can be learned. You know, every time I'm reading from someone who's got brilliant insight on business or or how companies build talent, you know, companies hire people, they don't hire skills. We've got to remember that. So what that means is if you don't have all the right skills, you can learn skills, you can get trained. What's much more important is your attitude. So if you work on your attitude, your desire to do whatever it takes to take on extra responsibilities, to have a I can rather than I can't attitude. If you can work on that and ensure that when you meet anyone, you come across as someone who's who will always, you know, be there looking for extra responsibility and and have a you know a, a, be a great team worker, have a great attitude around the office. You know, those people get hired just because they they show that they're the sort of person you want to have in your business. Okay, that makes sense. Is there a moment or is there a period that you, you can say that it's too late to get into investment banking? And the reason why I'm asking is, you know, you hear a lot of people saying that investment banking is your young men's business because you start out yeah. as a 21, 22-year-old. You're, you're, of course, you're working very long hours. So if you're, let's say, you're 28, between 28 and 30, and you you think you want to get into investment banking, do you think that person is probably a bit too late, or there is no such a thing as too late? Well, I don't want to be black and white on the answer. I'd say it's, let, let, let's first of all think about why they, they like to hire, investment banks like to hire grads. They want to get raw material who they can just pick up and train, train in their in their culture, grow them, you know, like a J.P. Morgan. Let's let, I want a J.P. Morgan person, so I take this young recruit who's green and I and I immerse them in the J.P. Morgan way. So they like to take on these youngsters, and also there's a cost consideration, of course. You know, junior talent is is typically better value than people who may be coming along with some experience. But um, I'd never say never. I would come back to the idea that can you can you do the job at hand? better than any other candidate and if the answer is yes you've got a shot as long as your requirements are in line with you know what the job will pay and all, all the rest of it you know obviously it's a, in an extreme they also want people who've got a what might be called runway so plenty of opportunity to grow and develop ahead of them so you know you're not going to hire a, an incredibly experience or mid-30s guy if you really wanted someone who was 23 and young and raw but yeah I, I don't see 27 28 that's still young people have a ton to give you know and it, it will come down to are they, are they a very strong candidate and can they come in and make a difference and equally if they're a bit more mature leo maybe they they can step up and be good material for promotion more quickly maybe they can adapt more quickly you know, if if they hit the learning curve and run right up it because they're a little bit more advanced, great. Okay. Now let's transition to the second part and talk about mm. some things that we can do during the interview. I read an mm. article that you wrote, very, very interesting, and it's called How to Build a Report with Your Interviewer. And mm. what I like about it is that you try to make the argument that you have to leverage the fact that even though there is an interviewer with a lot more power than you in the interview. They're, we're still all social creatures. We're human beings. So can, right. Can, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, you know, as, as I try to understand the importance of, of these kind of, you know, almost intangibles versus what your experience is, you know, it, it struck me that we all, as hiring managers, we all suffer from this, this big thing called unconscious bias where we have a gut reaction on someone the moment we see them and and we we as you say we're social creatures those 
we're programmed to get on with people. We're programmed to be tribal, you know. And this programming dates, you know, at least two and a half million years since um, you know human beings have first literally been walking around two and a half million years. So that's that's in our evolutionary instinct, and it's very hard to suppress. And I, I fundamentally believe that a hiring manager will not hire someone that they don't like. You know, unless unless their skills are so awesome that they'll put this guy in the team, even if they're, you know, for want of a better word, a jerk or difficult. You know, ultimately, most opportunities that we're talking about are working in teams in large organizations, and you've got to be someone who can build relationships. And a rapport is the start of a relationship. So it is it's incredibly important that you understand the skills or, or how you create a rapport and once you've got that, you specifically go in the interview with a, an intention to create, to have that likability, you know, eye contact, smiling, the correct body language, good quality listening, all of the things that, you know, that really are probably even something that the interviewer himself or herself won't consciously be aware of. All they'll know is that they like you. Now, I read another article that you wrote, and I'm going to quote what you wrote here and and maybe ask you to comment on it. Uh, You said, the fact is, as an interviewer, there are a few things more irritating than a candidate who thinks they are smarter than they really are. Can you please comment on that? (laughs) Sure. Well, I've had some funny interviews in my my time where, I mean, the, the biggest mistake is for someone to put on their CV something that sounds impressive but probably isn't true so you know I've had CVs where someone's claimed that they've written some portfolio optimization theory or something mm-hmm. or they've um, done a dissertation on options pricing so those kind of things you want to test in an interview so I, I recall distinctly asking a candidate around um, some various option strategies that would you, that you would use if you were looking to have a bullish exposure in fixed income or something like that, and very quickly under you know in a, in a kind of a setup of intense pressure, which an interview is, the the candidate you know had literally suffered from brain freeze, could not think clearly through an answer that they probably should have known or, or could have at least made a good stab at, but by claiming that they know something and then being found that they don't, that's really a poor, poor way to try and impress someone. So you just be, whatever you want to, to do, it's so tempting to say you're brilliant at everything, but just be, just be careful that you can back up. Whatever you claim you can do, make sure you can back it up, and not just sitting at home thinking it through with your slippers on, relaxing, you know, in an intense interview situation where you're going to be under pressure, and if you, if you begin to forget something, then quickly that can spiral out of control and you can melt down. And I've, I've seen people melting down, and it's not pretty. <laughs> so for, for goodness sake, avoid giving an over-impression about your skills on something. Now, is it okay to say, I don't know? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good one. I think it's got to be in response to a question which is not fundamental to the job you're applying for, okay? Because clearly, you know, if, it, if you're applying to be an asset manager and you, you, you don't know what a balanced portfolio is, you know, you're going to come unstuck quickly. But if it's, you know, if it's not such a critical question, I think it's a good option because you avoid guessing or making something up. And, you know, often interviewers all they want to do is catch people out and take them out of their comfort zone and see how they react um you know a friend of mine who's an md at ubs he he told me once expressly when he interviews graduates he he deliberately takes them out of their comfort zone just to see how they react under pressure and Mm -hmm. when people scramble around make stuff up um you know don't sound confident it's it's a bad way to handle being out of your comfort zone. If you say you don't know, essentially in a workplace situation, if you don't know, you're going to put your hand up and ask for help, which avoids mistakes. So that's it can be a good answer. I want to talk a bit about preparation. I know some people that actually spend a lot of time practicing exactly what they're going to say when asked those, you know, the regular questions. What are your weaknesses and strengths? What, mm. what do you want to do with your career? So... How much do you recommend a candidate to actually practice the exact answers they're going to give during the interview? 
Yeah. You know what, when I first started, you know, really putting my thoughts together around interviewing, I I kind of thought you could rehearse these these kind of standard answers, but actually, you know, the more I thought about it, the more I think that's a mistake. You know, if it you know, if it comes across as scripted, you know, or, or in any way unnatural, and let's face it, these you know candidates are not actors; they're not experts at reading from a script. Right. Uh, I, I kind of think that's going to it's going to stand out like a sore thumb, and all the interviewer will think was that guy expected that question, or that girl expected that question. They've they've rehearsed it, but it didn't sound genuine. Uh, you know, uh, if you know your stuff, and if you're interviewing for a job that you really care about, and you've done your homework, I, I, I think you've got to rely on your capacity to. Just think a question through. Don't rush out an answer, but just come up with what you sincerely believe to be the, the best answer that you have with the amount of passion that you can bring in the moment. Um, and honesty and authenticity, because, you know, the, the thing that I believe more than many other things about interviewing is that interviewers just want to get a sense of who's this real person, you know, and if there's any suggestion that they're lying or they're somehow not the real person you know again coming back to the subconscious or unconscious bias big big red flags go up and and you get you get a, a somehow a feeling you know there's something about this candidate that doesn't feel right okay. and then you're dead and then you're dead really so avoid yeah really avoid obsessing around a scripted answer just make sure you know you're confident you know really why you deserve the job and just rely on you know bringing those stories to life to to kind of sell yourself in a very genuine way uh now okay i'm i've done my homework i mm -hmm. my my cv is spotless my cover letter is great i went to the interview i mm. nailed the interview i got hired yeah so now we're after so mm. w what are some of the things that you would uh, recommend a young professional uh, let's let's focus on investment banking i know that a lot mm. of what you're probably going to say applies to other to other areas as well but what are some of the mm. things that you can do as a young professional in order to increase or to maybe speed up the process of going from an analyst to where you ended up being as an md sure okay well you know i could think of something very concrete when in my first ever sales job that was at barclays capital i was selling you know, product that you'll be aware with, uh, aware of, I guess, fan brief, you know, German mortgage-backed securities, right, effectively. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what I just noticed was that no salesperson in the team was producing any kind of content or write-up of what was going on in the, in the market to share with other salespeople. And I thought, you know what? I'm selling this product. I could put something together, you know, the odd trade idea and a bit of commentary on flows and everything, pull it together every day, circulate it around the sales force. And I did that because I, I just thought it was genuinely going to be of benefit to the team because the, the whole team had to market the product. And I got on with it and did it without asking any permission, just did it. And then, lo and behold, about two months later in um, in a meeting run by the, the, the head of the whole sales business, which was probably 30 salespeople at, at the time, he said... This thing that Ian's done, uh, marketing fan brief around the, the sales team, this is brilliant. You know, all of you need to think about how you can do something like this. <laughs> I.e., you know, without trying to shout, sound big-headed, but you know, just contribute without being asked to contribute. Look, look around you. Look, think about what what could you do that adds value to other people. And I think that's such a brilliant attitude when you're young because. It's, it's often hard to think, how can, I, how can you add value? You, you know, you've got limited responsibility. You've probably not got any clients if it's in a client-facing business, or you're probably not taking any risk if it's in a, a risk business. You know, you, you, you're getting to do the, the kind of the work at the bottom of the ladder, but just think to yourself, what can I do? How, how can I do something that's not happening to help the people around me? And, you know, you will be noticed, I promise you. So that's a great thought process a great attitude to have do something without being asked to do it is awesome now i i also came across an article that you wrote uh titled improved performance in anything deconstructed and i know yes. by the way by the way i noticed that you you quote a lot of books and i i read a lot as well so i'm going to get mm. to that question at the very end some of the books that you read uh, okay. and you 
you talk about the formula of performance. Can you talk about mm. that? Sure. So, um, I mean, for, for listeners, this is this comes from a guy who was originally a sports coach, Tim Galway, and he wrote a book called The Inner Game of Tennis. And if anyone's interested in tennis, well worth reading the book. Uh, and he really, he was the first kind of sports coach to move away from thinking too technically about what's going on with the player and his body position, the ball and the racket, and just try to look at getting inside the mind of the player and get them to sense what's what was in the way. If they hit a bad shot, what, what part of the body didn't feel right? Don't assume as the coach you can see it. Just trust that the player will be able to identify it if they think about it. So the principle is what you're doing is you're identifying um, interferences. So this, this formula goes along the following lines. It says that your performance in anything you're doing equals uh, your potential performance uh, minus interference. So what you could possibly do at your very best minus anything that's getting in the way. And I think it's a very simple but powerful way to think about why we have a bad day or how we can get better. Think about what's getting in the way. And the, I think the most important or, or useful thing about this, this simple equation is that you very quickly, when you think about your interferences, you start to think about, okay, what's going on inside me? What, what does my inner voice say to me? Is it, is it building up confidence or is it, is it causing me to be cautious or not believing myself? And essentially, by, by thinking it through, you build self-awareness around, you know, being honest to yourself. What's holding me back? What's in the way? What's facing me that I'm not facing up to? And, okay. you know, it's a, good, it's a good discipline to really just be introspective about, you know, what's going inside my head. Because your, your thought processes decide, or your thoughts decide your actions and your decisions. If you can think what's blocking you from doing better, if you can identify that, then you're well on your way to fixing it. Okay. I'd, I'd be curious to know what are some tactical things that you can do with your with your day. You know, if there is a routine that you can you can perform daily, or you know, food that you eat, anything that you can do to improve your chances of being at your absolute best at work. Okay. I'll, 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 first of all, disclaimer, I'm no food expert, <laughs> so, <laughs> so please, I don't want any listeners to start rushing out and buying the wrong stuff, so I won't go too deep into that. But in, in general, yeah, I always found that I'm at my best when I'm feeling healthy and energized and I've got a good, essentially I've got a good exercise regime going on. And, you know, I made a concrete decision yeah, probably about 10 years ago now that to be more effective in my job, I wanted to put more energy into my into my body and feel more effective the moment I sprang out of bed. So I think you've got to be aware that, you know, you, you need to be feel healthy and energized to show up at work uh, uh, and be effective for 10, 12 hours. You know, I, I'd say just from... The, the kind of exploring I've done around understanding the brain. Conscious thought as opposed to unconscious thought consumes a huge amount of energy because given the size of our brains, I think, you know, around even a half of our daily glucose requirement can be consumed by the brain if, if we're in a very active thought mode. So if you've got to work on a tough project, you've got to think something complex through and often solving problems resolves, involves a lot of you know, capacity to think through difficult issues uh, in, in this world. Make sure you're eating, you, you're, in, you're putting energy in because you burn calories, burn glucose um, when you're thinking hard. And that's why you know, we can go home at the end of the day and feel, wow, I'm drained, I'm shattered just from thinking. And that's why, because you burn energy. So that, that's definitely going to help. I think, in, you know, in practical terms, day to day, be aware of, manage yourself, you know, look at, do an audit of the time you dedicate to various activities during the day. You know, one of my favorite books, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey goes through in detail a very effective self-management or time management structure which forces you to recognize that stuff you're doing today may not be developing your, your business. You may be spending too much time around what seems urgent but is not important type stuff and ignoring 
much more important but less urgent work, which is strategic thinking about how to develop your career, your business, that kind of stuff. So being aware when you're in the office every day, is the time I'm spending on this activity, is this adding to the value I'm bringing to the workplace or not? And be disciplined around that. And, you know, I I always remember a great boss I had seven, eight years ago who was so structured around this. He would block off every Tuesday and Wednesday morning, no meetings, just for his strategic thinking time. And he was religious around this. And his greatest strength was he would do the most amazing town halls, presentations, business plans to get everyone fired up because he dedicated the time to thinking through the business and working on this kind of really long-term, very important stuff. So that, that's, that's a great habit if you can get into it. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that you know, if, you're, if you are already at a very high level at a company, if you actually put on your Outlook calendar that you're taking time off to think, it should be okay. Mm. But if you're talking yeah. about people at, at lower levels, I don't know how well that will, that will go. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, look, here, here's the thing. So in reality, every Friday afternoon, most people are kind of you know, winding down a bit. Unless you've got a big project on every weekend, most people are winding down. You have the choice to wind down or take two hours out to just say, what have I done this week that's effective? What do I need to do next week that's effective? You know, it's, it's just discipline around thinking how to add value and create value and, and get into these kind of good habits. And, you know, I'll be honest, Leo, I never had these when I was 25 or 30, I'll be honest. But uh, I've got a lot more wisdom around how I would operate if I had another go, that's for sure. Okay. There's a, you probably have read the books of Tim Ferriss and, and the four-hour work week. Mm. And he talks about distraction at work. Email is the greatest distractor in, in, in any office you go to, I think. I think people mm. spend way too much time on email answering questions that people could maybe answer themselves and distracting you from doing work that's actually uh, worth doing. Mm. So I'm wondering if you have some other practical uh, suggestions for people to streamline their, their day yeah. to be more productive. Yeah, it's a very good question. I do, and I'm not going to lay claim to discovering these. Um, I read a very interesting book called How to Have a Good Day. Author's Caroline Webb, um, who I I worked with many years ago, and then she went off and did lots of different things, and she wrote this book last year, really in the same style as a Malcolm Gladwell-type book, kind of looking at a bit of psychology, a bit of neuroscience, throwing a bit of economics in there to understand how to be effective during the day. One thing that she talks about, similar to Tim Ferriss, is this idea of batching work, so doing work in batches. And she, So what that means is if you need to do some emails, save them up to a certain time, spend half an hour killing them off and then leave it. If you need to make some phone calls, maybe book an hour in, the, in your mind or book an hour in your diary, that's my phone call hour and crack on with phone calls. But the science behind this is very interesting. Basically, she asserts and shows that the brain is not good at switching activity. There's kind of, it's almost like changing gear. There's a downtime between thinking about one thing and thinking about something different and, you know, spinning up to speed on that different activity. And the way, if I remember rightly, the way she illustrates it brilliantly is she said, look, do the following exercise. Count from one to eight. Easy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Count from A to G or H, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Now, count, so I've just batched 1 to 8 and A to H. Now, mix them together. How quickly can I say 1, A, 2, B, 3, C, 4, D, 5, <laughs> right? It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's a lot harder to, stu- to switch between activities and that's, that's the theory behind our idea that batching activity just makes you much more efficient with your time so just get people you know I'd advise the listeners map out the typical activities you have through the week see how you can group them together to bring them into batches and you'll find that you create more time for all the really good stuff that you need to be doing that you can't find time for today okay but I want to ask you if you have books that you would recommend uh, our mm. listeners to to read. 
in order to I mean it can be books about you know uh, interviewing skills or 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 career focused but it can be anything else too don't feel like this has to be constrained to the topic of our of our conversation <laughs> Well, sure. Well, look, I mean, I, I try and read widely. I think that's the key. Read widely. You know, feed your brain with lots of different thoughts because if you, if you, if you like to sift through ideas and come to your own conclusions, throw lots of different things into the mix. So, what, you know, what does that mean? Certainly my favorite book in terms of managing myself is The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which I mentioned. I'm in the middle right now of reading a book written in the 80s in search of excellence, which is identifying what great companies were doing in the U.S. at the time. I, I read, if you, if you want to really fire yourself up to be successful, uh, Think and Grow Rich, written by Napoleon Hill in about 1937 or so, something like that. You know, hop around between genres and and think who could be great. Who's a mentor for me? Who's been there and changed the world, done something amazing? How can I understand what was going through their brain as they went on their journey? So, you know, I bought the Sam Walton biography, um, Made in America, the Walmart story. Because well, why wouldn't I want to understand how a guy who built the biggest, most successful retailing business ever almost in his time you know why wouldn't I want to understand how how he made it happen so you know just just don't confine yourself to something narrowly relevant to your career or your career aspirations you know just just look around broadly you know I've got to, I need to read the Einstein biography uh, Walter Samuelson uh, sorry Walter Isaacson is the author. He wrote the Steve Jobs biography that right. sold, sold brilliantly a few years ago. He's written seven or eight fantastic biographies all around people who've really reshaped the world in their, in their uh, era. You know, just consume that knowledge and just, just suck it up and see what you think of it. It's brilliant. Yeah, I can hear people say, but I don't have any time. You have to find the time. You have to find the time for that. That's a priority, right? I was just going to say, you and me, we've got exactly the same amount of time as Richard Branson or Elon Musk or Bill Gates or anyone else. It's just what we choose to do with it that counts. That, that is true. There are a few books that you might like as well. You might have read them already. Shoe Dog? Have you read All that right. one? No, I haven't. What's uh, that it's about? The, it's about the, it's a biography of the uh, founder of Nike, uh, Phil ah, Knight. Yeah, extremely, yeah. Extremely good. Mm -hmm. So I think you, you would like that one. And the other one that I was very surprised about was the biography of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't know if you've, you've read it. Uh, okay. But ex extremely well written, a great story. It's about a person who doesn't really, it doesn't feel like he thinks much about his decisions. And I know that you've written about it. I, everyone thinks about it before making a decision. But yeah. it feels like his uh, his time between thinking about something and doing it is so short that he mm. just goes ahead and, and does it. And he says that he became a millionaire long before he started his acting career. He he was in the real estate business in California. Mm. Is that right? Yeah. So so I think those mm. are some that you might like because I, I noticed yeah. that you like biographies and autobiographies. And yeah. maybe the listeners would, would, would enjoy it as well. Yeah. And just one last thing before we go. Actually, two things. Is there anything I did not ask you or anything that you haven't said today that you would like to leave our audience with? And two, where can people find out more about you and what you do? Okay. All right. Two good questions. I have kind of mentioned it, but I, I think in, in everything you do, in, in, in the way you uh, look at everything that comes across you and life is all about problem solving and handling tough stuff, okay, it's not always a bed of roses. You've got a choice. You can you can be positive, or you you can be glass half full, or you can be glass half empty, and just just choose to be half full. You know, it is such an advantage if you have this outlook where you believe every problem has a solution. You know, I can I can make this happen. I believe I can get this thing done, because but if you believe you can, I mean, there's this great for, uh, quote from um, Henry Ford: "If you think uh, you can." then you're right, and if you think you can't, then you're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So true, so true. And it, it's just fundamental to, I believe, the biggest difference between anyone who's done something incredible in this world and the rest of us who haven't, those guys who've done something incredible, it's, it, it starts with this belief, this, this kind of burning 
desire that they can make something happen and they go and make it happen so that that's that's a big big thing in my life now try and just be positive and always show up positive don't criticize people try and work on positive ideas um it's, it, and it fills you with energy as well that's fantastic okay the second question yeah great so where people can find more about me well i'm, I'm obviously on linkedin so ian morgan my profile is right there on linkedin where i'm always trying to write some interesting stuff about what's going on in my life and my head and how I look at the world. I have a dedicated interviewing website called uh, interviewbuddy.com where I've got a whole bunch of articles exploring all the kind of stuff we've talked about on, on the podcast. And then I have, uh, if, if anyone's interested in building their business and <laughs> wants to think about business, I've got a new website. I've just got up bigbusinessvision.co.uk where I want people who, to have a big vision about what they can achieve with their with their business. So, you know, a bunch of different things going on. All of those avenues you can reach and get hold of me, and I'll be happy to have a chat with anyone who thinks uh, I could be of help. Okay. Well, great. Well, just for just a, a word of caution to anyone who starts reading Yen's article, make sure you have a lot of time in your hand because he has a lot of them, and they're all really, really good. So, uh, Yen, it's it's been a, a great pleasure to talk to you today. So, thank you for taking some time out of of your busy schedule, and I really hope that people got a lot out of it as much as I did. And uh, we hope to stay in touch with you. It's been an absolute pleasure, Leo, and uh, all the best for uh, for the podcast and 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 the website as well. I hope it leads to great things for you guys. Thank you for listening to the Wall Street Lab podcast. For the show notes and much more, visit us at www.thewallstreetlab.com. To see what we're up to before anyone else, subscribe to our newsletter on our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. The information contained in this podcast constitutes the opinions of individuals and should not be treated as investment, tax, financial or legal advice. We take no responsibility for the accuracy of any statements made in this podcast. Any copying, distribution or reproduction of this podcast without the permission of the creators of the podcast is strictly prohibited.